Hello everyone and welcome to today's session. Uh, it's just before one o'clock so we'll give everyone uh, a few more minutes uh, before we get started. I'd just like to say a huge welcome to everyone today and thank you for joining us to, just to talk about insects awareness and DE&I. So yeah we'll give uh, another minute or so and then we will be kicking off. Okay, so it's one o'clock, so let's uh, let's start and we can uh, catch people who join as we move through the housekeeping and just introduction piece of today. So uh, welcome everyone to today's conversation, a bite-sized 30-minute session with LGBT Great, looking at intersex awareness, uh, DE&I, and a few um, pieces of reflections and, and thoughts from our side around uh, intersex, uh, what it means to be intersex, etc. Uh, my name is Alex Hoare. I'm the Global Insights and Content Manager here at LGBT Great. I'm delighted to be joined by Shreyas, who's one of our amazing research analysts today. Hey Shrey, how are you doing? Pretty good. I'm actually looking forward to the conversation. I think this is a conversation that we really need to have um, and just create awareness around intersex identities. So really just excited for it. Great. And then also on the line you have um, Hector, who's our uh, marketing brand manager. Hey Hector, how are you doing today? Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar. Good. I think Hector will be on the chat function. So um, today there are a range of ways in which you can uh, you can engage with us and you can uh, share your thoughts, uh, opinions uh, and questions as we go through. In the bottom of your screen you should see a, a Q&A and a chat function. Please feel free to make use of either or both of these as we go through the session today. Um, the chat function will enable you to chat with all of the participants um, as well as all of the attendees um, and then the Q&A function will allow you to send uh, questions to the panelists here um, either anonymously or with your name so um, whatever you feel comfortable doing uh, please do feel free to do that as we go through the session today um, we really value your thoughts opinions um, and questions so please don't hesitate to to drop those in as we go uh, there will be a bit of time for questions as we as we progress through the conversation today. Right, so, um, you know, we don't want to keep this to be too long, but we did want to provide an opportunity to discuss, um, you know, what is it, what is the words around intersex awareness, what do we mean, what are we talking about, what do we, what do we mean when we say in, an intersex person. So we are going to talk a little bit about that, um, as well as providing you with uh, four, uh, an understanding of the four pillars of LGBT identities, which uh, for those that are joining from our member network who know us, uh, is a slide you will have seen before, but um, is a good starting point, particularly in this conversation around intersex identities. Um, Shreyas has been doing a bit of um, research into um, the organisations uh, and the latest uh, trends and news um, as they relate to intersex people at the moment, so um, we're going to share a few of those thoughts with you. Um, and then we'll end today by just reflecting briefly as a, as a group on um, uh, LGBT and intersex inclusive language, and then of course uh, to end just by talking about allyship, which is so critical. Um, and that's kind of where we're uh, hoping to take the conversation today. Uh, as I say, please do feel free to drop any questions um, as we go through and we'll cover those off as they as they come. Um, not to spend too much time talking about us, but uh, for those of you that are not familiar with um, with LGBT Great, firstly, welcome. Uh, if this is the first time that you're you're engaging with us today, for those that do know us, hello again. Um, and just briefly, LGBT Great is a member organization for financial services um, intended to um, support firms to improve their LGBT plus DE&I across a range of products and services and programs. Um, I lead on the, the data and insights side, so the red section here, um, and then we have our visibility and outreach programs um, which cover off role modeling, mentoring, um, events, uh, in addition to training and uh, data collection and insights, etc. So, you know, hopefully it's a bit of a full spectrum um, offering. Uh, and if you're interested in, in any aspect of the work that we do and how LGBT Great might be able to support your organization to improve or understand your LGBT plus DEI uh, journey and where you are currently, then please do feel free to get in touch. Um, this slide is fairly self-explanatory, just shows you a few of the firms that we are working with at the moment. And if you're from any of these, then hello, hello. Um, and that's basically where we are from, from an LGBT great perspective. But um, 
I think today it is a very important um, day in the awareness calendar um, as regards intersex people. And uh, for those that are, are familiar, the when you think of the expanded uh, LGBT acronym, so LGBTQIA+, um, the I there stands for intersex, um, and is a aspect of the LGBT community that um, I think we don't always talk about as much. Um, of course, not being part of the community myself, um, it's you know some uh, I am guilty too of um, of forgetting of um, you know not including etc. So um, today we thought um, just in a, in a in a short session we would um, open that door to the to the conversation uh, amongst LGBT great and and of course our our members um, and partners. Um, and of course, all of you in the audience as well. So the goal of today really was to share with you a few of the things that we've learned in, in this um, program um, of, of celebration, et cetera. Um, and just to acknowledge the fact that you know, while we don't have an intersex person currently on the, on the panel, uh, nor working with us, we do have big plans for, for intersex awareness um, and de &I in the future. Um, so this is just intended to be a bit of an introduction to that conversation, but there are um, bigger things to come, uh, just to acknowledge, acknowledge a bit of that elephant in the room. Um, we, we did consider you know, not running this session because we didn't have an intersex person to, to speak for the community, but we thought actually it would be good to just um, share with you some of the the, the, the data, some of the, the introductory pieces of information that we that we found uh, useful. Um, and you know, LGBT Great's role here is to make sure that there's a platform to host conversations, to um, to explore some of these issues, particularly for the, um, parts of the community that are underrepresented. Now, having said that, I do have a little bit of a call to action for anyone on the call today. If um, you or anyone in your network or that you know um, is themselves intersex or is closely linked with the intersex community or organizations, um, we would love to get in touch with them um, and we would love to be able to offer them uh, the opportunity to come, you know, help us um, in understanding this, to help us with, with panel discussions or to, to get more involved um, with, with them and the, the community. So uh, do drop me a note if you have any um, contacts that you would like to share and we'd be very interested in having a conversation with them. Uh, okay, that's the, the introduction and the plug done. Um, we'll start the, the conversation today around intersex awareness just by reflecting briefly on the four pillars of LGBT identities. Now, when you think of an LGBT person, there are obviously a myriad number of, of aspects to that person's identity, just like there are to, to everyone's. Um, we talk here about intersectionality, so the various aspects of your identity that, that coalesce and, and make you who you are. For LGBT people specifically, there are four kind of pillars um, that will help uh, in the exploration and expression of those uh, of that identity from an LGBT perspective. And they are gender identity, sexual romantic attraction, biological sex, and gender expression. Um, and so these, the way that these uh, relate to each other, the way that they combine overlap in that unique way uh, that makes you you um, is essentially what we're, we're talking about here. And the reason that I think this is a good place to start is because, you know, one of the foundational aspects of, of being intersex is all related to, um, you know, biological gender, uh, which is the third pillar in the LGBT um, uh, sort of pillars. Uh, so here we have biological sex, talking about biological characteristics. So we're talking about, um, you know, someone with genitalia, we're talking about um, chromosomes, we're talking about primary and secondary biological expressions of gender. So this could be, um, of course, you know, your XY chromosomes in the primary instance, down to secondary instances, such as, you know, typically, um, someone who is Aside male at birth will have larger hands, you know, will have a broader wingspan, may have different body proportions, etc. Um, you know, may experience <laughs> puberty in different ways. And so, um, you know, these are primary and secondary biological characteristics here. So, um, you know, and this is very important for the conversation today around intersex identities. One thing we should probably also acknowledge is that, um, you know, the relationship between biological sex and gender identity is extremely important as well. Um, so it's essentially when you are born, you are assigned male or female at birth. Um, obviously, there's an intersex angle here that we need to need to be sensitive to, too, but we'll come to that in a minute. Um, but sticking to the binary for now, um, we have, you know, your binary male, female assigned at birth, and then uh, that does not necessarily correlate with the internal sense of your own identity. So um, the relationship between gender identity and biological sex is what forms um, 
you know, the, what, what results in the term cisgender, which is where your biological sex does correlate with your internal sense of your own, uh, you know, gender identity. And then someone who is transgender, um, their biological sex, or, you know, the sex assigned at birth does not correlate with their, with their gender identity. So those are kind of how those two pillars relate to each other. Um, and then that's the kind of internal uh, aspect uh, expression. Gender expression is then the externalization of that. So that's through the clothes you wear, the way you carry yourself, how you express your, you know, through language, et cetera. Um, I always say this, but I'm, you know, always end up seem to be wearing the same thing, but which is, you know, a masculine shirt and jumper. So, you know, you can see from my, for me, um, I was assigned male at birth, identify as a man and I'm expressing my gender in a masculine way. So very kind of prototypical um, here, but, you know, for many people, um, the relationships between these three pillars is a, is a fundamental um, aspect of how they, you know, want to navigate the world and crucial to their, their LGBT plus identity and part of the community. Um, attraction then is around your sexual and romantic attraction. Um, and so the relationships between these four pillars kind of contribute to, to where you are within the community. Now, I think that's an important place to start really with this conversation around um, intersex awareness because um, the existence of intersex people is proof that nature doesn't see gender as a binary. So one of the things we'll talk about today is that the reality for intersex people is that um, biological gender is actually not a binary. So there are, is actually a spectrum of biological gender. And this is where the nuance of the conversation on intersex people is very important. Simply put, an intersex person is someone who falls along this spectrum of biological gender. So obviously we have you know, XX and XY chromosomes make up whether you're female or male, etc. Um, but there are a range of biological uh, factors that go into the development of one's biological gender, um, such that a doctor would say, I can assign this person male or female at birth, right? Um, and those are more nuanced than we often actually have time to talk about. Um, and so in the conversation around biological sex, um, we need to be conscious that actually, that just as gender identity is a spectrum, biological sex is also a spectrum. And those that <coughs> fall along that spectrum and not at the ends of the binary are intersex. That's basically what we're talking about today. Um, Shrey, would you like to add anything here just around, you know, that the introduction on on intersex people and, and biological gender spectrums, spectra. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. I think that foundation was very important in underpinning the for the conversation that we're going to have. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, I think like one thing that resonates with me about this quote is because I've met so many people, and I'm sure everyone in the audience has to, who are like, oh, according to biology, this is a mm. binary, which is absolutely wrong. Um, and I think not a lot of people know that. So I think this is like an educational moment for me personally to when I understood that even like your biological sex is now not a binary. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to talk about this further on the other slide, but I just like this quote really makes me feel, okay, I actually have a biological foundation too mm -hmm. to talk about when I talk about, oh, this is exactly a binary. Nothing is a binary for me personally. Yeah. Anyway, but moving on. Thank you so much for that, Alex. No, absolutely. And, and I think... You know, this is the com this is the point in which we have, you know, we do acknowledge one of the challenges and the nuances of of kind of sophisticated inclusive language for the LGBT community, which is, you know, that gender is is not just male or female. There is there are gradations of that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that actually means in a second. But I just want to kind of reassure people on the call that like it's okay to not know this. It's okay to, yeah. you know, not not have this at, the, at your fingertips when having that conversation um but you know the fact that you're here with us today is, is great and hopefully testament to the fact that this is the type of conversation that we're going to be having more often um and so i think if i can just charge everyone with a, with a couple of takeaways from today would just be um you know one is to you know join us in in learning a little bit more about what it means to be intersex two to to start that conversation within your a frame of reference your sphere of influence um to introduce that topic of conversation where you can and to you know act as an ally and leverage your own um, power status privilege and access to to bring intersex conversations onto the table um, more so than they currently are which as far as i'm aware isn't very often yeah. 
Okay, um, Shrey, I think I've been speaking quite a lot. I mean, if it's okay, um, I'd like to hand over to you now just to talk us through this slide because I know you've been you've been looking into some of the peer-reviewed articles and journals and things around intersex awareness uh, and around intersex biology and and, and uh, identity. So it'd be great to hear from you around um, you know what you've learned. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Um, yes, I have been working on that, and honestly, it's been a very interesting journey because I've learned so much over the past three days or two days. Um, but the idea, like, who are intersex people? I think the identity is very important to firstly um, break down. So it's basically an umbrella term for um, unique characteristics in reproductive or sexual anatomy. And these do not fit into your type, uh, typical binary notions of male or female bodies. And so basically genitals, chromosome patterns, gonads, meaning your testes, your ovaries. Um, so moving on, even like, it's not even just like, oh, there's only one kind of intersex identity. There are at least 40 different recognized variations, at least. So um, that just says on how much we are still yet to learn about intersex identities. And uh, honestly, I, like, as I've been looking through it, the literature is deficit, but I hope mm. it gets more um, rich as we progress with time. Um, so at least 40 different identities we can talk about, like um, there's a swear syndrome, over-testicular DSD, I mean, I was reading up, like, these are very medical terms, and I personally, for me, they were very um, enlightening, but I think too much for the conversation right now, mm. uh, because there's, they're very medically profound. Um, moving on, I think this is a very important factor, um, that intersex is, being intersex is not related to your sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, so there was this survey conducted by IHRA in 2015, in Australia. Um, so basically what they found out was there was like they it was 176 respondents and 48% of intersex people, all of the uh, respondents were intersex and 48% of them were heterosexual, 22% were bisexual, 6% were gay. And like there, there was like a lot of um, like different sexual orientations within the intersex umbrella. And then even they, like their identification as who they saw they were, was female 52%, male 23%, mm. and another, like they just uh, prescribed themselves as someone else, because again, this is very unique and beautiful. Um, and that was like 20%. So I think just looking at that, we know that even intersex people themselves do not even come close to uh, uh, like relating themselves only to sexual orientation or gender identity. It's a completely different biological set of terms. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there is the study conducted by CAP, Center for American Progress. And it talks about um, like how LGBT plus people are, uh, intersex LGBT plus people are, of course, you talk about hiring, un, uh, hiring, like promotions. They're obviously very, very um, like stigmatized. They, their career paths have been um, mis basically they didn't get their promotions and they I, like I was reading a case study specifically and it was very emotional to see how they were discriminated against um, and I think there's a lot of stigma around that but I think what what one thing that really really is important to point out is the like if you can see 60 percent of intersex people avoided the doctor's office in fear of discrimination um, I think this roots back to history because um uh, cutting it short, in 1950, in John Hopkins University, there was um, a team of researchers who wanted to cosmetically change everyone who's intersex into either male or either female. And since then, like this is this was like a funded program. People had researchers over this, and it was just devastating because there was this John Jones case who, for someone who who was turned into basically a female by uh, surgically. And they were not consented to this. And then um, they, like, later in life, they realized that they were intersex because no one told them. And then from Joan, they went back to John, which is, like, a very um, inspiring story, just showing how um, intersex people have been treated over mm. the last... I think you raise a really important point here, which is around, yeah. you know, obviously intersex... You know, the biology around being intersex is is, is very complicated and mm. um, it may express itself in in various ways um you know with the, the development of genitals etc um, but it might not always be that visible um so you know there's there's a real issue i think within the intersex community of you know understanding 
that you're part of the community, when does that actually occur? It can occur when you're a baby, if you're, you know, the doctor that identified that there's something un uh, different here, unexpected perhaps, it can happen in puberty as you as you develop and go through puberty, maybe potentially in an, an, a slightly different way. It might be that you have, um, you know, a breast tissue, you might have a um, hormonal imbalance, you might have, you know, more estrogen or more testosterone than you are expected to have, right? Which can mm -hmm. just be natural, um, you know, that can happen within the normal course of, of puberty anyway. Um, but, you know, that, that could then raise a question, or oh, maybe we should get this checked out and talk to the GP about it. And that's maybe when you discover that you, you might be intersex. It could also be when you're you know, later in life as, a, as an adult um, and something doesn't fit or you, you know, become exposed to something and you think, hey, that sounds like me. So, you know, visibility here around intersex role models and, and, and education around what does it mean to be intersex, um, you know, it, it is important just because, um, you know, typically, as I think that, that example, Shrey, demonstrates, there's a lot of stigma around this, there's a lot of lack of understanding, um, and there are historically have been a, a large number of medical interventions um, mm. for intersex people um, with an attempt to change them to their correct gender, right? So um, I think that's, that's particularly um, an issue. And I, th I suppose it goes to your next point here, which is why do you think this day is important? why do i think oh sorry i was also reading the chat um yeah uh, no we'll cover off the <laughs> chat we can cover off the questions in the chat in, oh, yeah. in just a second i think um, no, i think i mean personally for me because even like the movement the intersex movement in terms of getting human rights uh like mm -hmm. legislations is very very new like even i would even say newer than like the general lgbt plus community because intersex people have come in later in the historical timeline in terms of coming out and being like, oh, yes, we exist. I think that is very prominent. And there's less awareness about intersex identities than more ident uh, than, for example, lesbian identities, gay identities, and so many people who I've talked to, do, like just bringing in a casual conversation I was having yesterday. And I was like, yes, tomorrow's Intersex Awareness Day. And my friend was like, I don't know what that means. And I was a bit baffled because at least like everyone knows a lot of other identities within the spectrum, but this is like a very important day to highlight that there are many more, that uh, many more identities that we still need to acknowledge, mm -hmm. cover and spotlight. I completely, completely agree. And, you know, this is part of the role that we play at LGBT Great, which is to try and, you know, create a little bit of a space for this conversation. Um, yeah, um, just to cover off a couple of the questions that are coming through, um, one of them here was around um, the fact that quite a lot of the studies that um, that we referenced and that Shrey has been looking at are, you know, based on, in the US and and the the EU uh, particularly. Um, and I, you know, why is this, and is there any interesting, you know, parallels between the two regions? I think firstly, a, a point that just to expand on what Shrey mentioned is that um, there's currently a lack of uh, recognition globally. There's a lack of legislative protections for intersex people so in many instances you know there's you know are there rights around physical integrity around bodily autonomy not necessarily is there explicit anti-discrimination protection at work not necessarily is there you know uh, do you have 15 jurisdictions around the world still criminalize you know being you know gender expression that that goes against what is perceived to be correct for you um, and so the fact that there are a lack of um, you know, national um, explicit protections for intersex people um, can sometimes mean that it's hard to be visible. Um, it's hard to feel safe. Um, and also, you know, it, it, it hinders legitimate organizations from exploring intersex identities in those, in those jurisdictions out of fear of retaliation from, you know, anti-LGBT groups you know, or from lawmakers, from, from et cetera. So, you know, this is where organizations play a, a role, right? Because organizations have a bit of a, a, you know, they have a certain amount of freedom to implement policies that are inclusive. Um, of course, being mindful of, you know, other external factors but you know keep it does it, it does intersex feature in your DEI policy you know if it doesn't then you know that's one thing that if you have the ability to change that then you know could be could be very powerful this this um, in this conversation um we've had a question here around allyship for for, um, for intersex people um, and LGBT groups generally um I think that the Shrey have you got any thoughts on that around how do intersex people experience allyship from others? within the community? 
um, how they experience it. Yes, I think um, it's like a very important factor because I mean, uh, there are very less number of intersex people and mm -hmm. you know how minorities are always um, marginalized, um, I think. So we have to become like allies very actively. And I like personally for me, like a small thing that I could do yesterday, what I did was talk about intersex identities. So whenever I get the opportunity and I try to talk about identities which are beyond the general notion of um, knowledge. So a lot of like colloquial knowledge does not always correlate to LGBT plus I, uh, LGBT plus uh, DNI um, or just generally identity. So whenever I get uh, opportunity to speak about um, intersex identities, I do it actively. I'm like, okay, this is what um, I have learned. Maybe you can learn too. And I think that is like one of the strongest pillar of allyship because you're educating everyone else. Um, so that is for me, how I see allyship, especially for intersex identities. But Alex, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I think education is is critical here. And <clears throat> one impactful thing we can do is, um, you know, is to have, make sure that there, there are some spaces and there are opportunities to have these these conversations. Um, I think that that that's that's critical. I think education is is so important here because it is an extremely nuanced topic, um, and you know does have a relationship with the broader LGBT community. Um, one thing I can see someone in the in the in the to the panelists has talked about, um, you know, briefly the relationship between intersex people and trans people, uh, particularly given that you know we're talking about biology, biological sex here and, and and gender identity, and there is, you know, there is a and absolutely a connection between the two um but it is it is very important that we don't you know stray into the transphobic as well by you know undermining gender identity in favor of biological sex the i think in this conversation today given that you know intersex people are partly defined by the fact that they have a you know a, a position along this biological gender spectrum um that it's important to acknowledge that given that you know there are a range of factors that are directly impacting them as we already talked about medical interventions lack of understanding you know um hate and you know and that sort of thing fear of rejection and lack of explicit rights and protections um so it's it's very important that that members of the lgbt community um you know understand that um their role as allies is is intersectional um and is you know it's not just people outside of the lgbt community who are responsible for being good lgbt allies so you know if you're you need to be lgbtqia plus allies as much as we can uh, and part of that journey starts with education it starts with understanding some of the language and the terminology um, and it comes with you know asking questions and uh, i think challenging each other um like this person has done uh, very correctly um is uh so yeah i think that's that's kind of how i would what i would say on that but i'd be interested to hear what people in the chat um think really around around this is this something that you also think is is, is challenging to to navigate is this something that you want to see more of um you know let us let us know in the comments i think we'll just move on to to briefly on to looking at, at some of the um just some of the good things that have happened from an intersex perspective uh, explicitly. Um, and Trey, do you want to just talk us through, um, you know, some of these aspects here? No, absolutely. Um, so like Greece very recently bans quote unquote sex normalizing surgeries on intersex children. So a lot of intersex children with, of course, because they're babies, uh, a lot of them go through these procedures and it is still legal in many countries, but we can see jurisdictions changing that, which I think is very important because, um, they should have their own like say in it and as a baby you obviously cannot um so i think that is a very good um starting point with greece and then australia so act australian capital territory just drafted a intersex law preventing medical procedures on intersex without consent so even um like for example there were cases in australia where um uh, there were cases in australia where uh, like intersex teenagers were being forced um to go through surgeries by their parents. So I think that was like a very good step forward in the right direction for me personally. And um, moving on a bit slightly gloomy news in Cameroon in 2021, an intersex person was a victim of a very bad attack. Um, they were brutally assaulted and 
It was just devastating, which just shows how much stigma and discrimination still exists in society. And I think it's very important to acknowledge that as well. And moving on to Kenya, which I think is the uh, like very, very like uh, progressive in terms of um, intersex identities, because there's a new law that grants equal rights and recognition to intersex people. But there is another nuance to this, because recently, Dr. Dennis Nyong-Gesa, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, um, was cho chosen as like the commissioner, uh, the head of the Kenyan Commission for Human Rights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was, that's like a very important thing and they're intersex. So I think someone in the office uh, representing like the government of Kenya that I think is a very, very, very big stop, a step forward. And then, then we already have like intersex organizations, mm -hmm. many of them, like only, I've only listed five, but um, like these are some, some of the organizations around the world. But honestly, there's so many, and I, I was so glad to see that there's so much activism happening and like so much people coming out and talking about intersex identities um, throughout the world. So yeah, I, what are your takes? Like, what is, am I yeah. saying something right? Is it good? Oh, no, no. I mean, <laughs> I'm not in a position to sort of say right or wrong. I think, you know, this is yeah. an important opportunity just to, uh, just to explore this together as a, as a community. Yeah. So, you know, it's really wonderful to see such progressive um, you know aspects here from from Kenya, which is which is wonderful. And yeah. um, we've had another question come through just to further clarification on the relationship between um, trans and intersex people. So I thought I would just spend the last minute just going over that as yeah. clearly as I as I can. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that transgender and intersex are terms that are frequently confused um and that's and that's okay um so i'll just try and spell it out as clearly as i can so mm -hmm. um you know, someone who's transgender has a gender that is different from the one that they were uh, or traditionally associated with the sex that they were assigned at birth an intersex person is someone who is born with a variation in their sexual reproductive anatomy such that their body then doesn't fit the typical binary male female gender kind of definition However, we should say that both intersex and transgender people can identify as men, as women, as gender fluid, as non-binary, um, or you know, in, in a myriad of different ways as, as the gender spectrum, the gender identity spectrum kind of you know, allows you to. Um, while transgender people may, may identify kind of differently to how they were assigned at birth, um, their biology at birth you know, typically conforms to one of those binary categorizations. Now, an intersex person cannot therefore transition to be intersex because having an intersex condition is actually just, you know, is that variation in reproductive biology um, and is present at, at birth. Um, and there, so yeah, so, it, you know, it's also, we should say that intersex people can also be transgender, right, as well. So that, I hope that kind of clears up just a, a little bit of the terminology here. So I know that um, the, the, the conversation around biology is, is really challenging and, and is, um, in many ways leveraged in a negative way um, to, to discuss, um, you know, transphobic aspects. But from an intersex point of view, there's a quite a, a clear distinction um, and intersex people face their own myriad of challenges and issues as well, which is what we're really focusing on today. Yeah. Um, anything else from, from you, Shrey? Just we've, we've hit the half an hour, so I want to wrap up uh, briefly. Oh, really? Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh... But I think like one similarity that they both like the, both intersex identities and transgender identities face is the lack of bodily autonomy because everyone's mm. trying to control their bodies. And I think that is somewhere that they really align because we're like, yes, we just want our own bodies mm. to be who we are really, truly. And I think that is something that they uh, like both the identities have a, like a similar sense of in a lot of ways, um, like they, they perceive their own body is themselves and we all do. And then there's obviously um, bodily autonomy being like the cornerstone of our identities. So I think like just removing that from the, both like transgender identities or sex identities is supremely problematic. And I think both of the identities are always fighting for bodily autonomy and they can intersect all the time. That's, I think that is like the most beautiful part because mm. both intersex identities and transgender identities intersect too. Great. Okay, amazing. Thank you for that. I think we'll uh, we've hit the half an hour, so I'm conscious that I want to to wrap up. But um, I think we'll just end with um a few thoughts around allyship, if that's okay. Um, so I suppose it would be um be good. Just are there any a few things that anyone could do today to be a you know an intersex ally from your perspective, Shrey? 
Mm, like for me, I, as I said, I just try to like use my pronouns because of course there's mm. a lot of, uh, because intersex people use very specific pronouns too, as a lot of us do. And I think that is the use of pronouns for me personally is very important. As you mm. can see, I am he, they, and I am genderqueer. So I think um, that is a very important factor in my identity. And I believe everyone else's identity too, to some extent. And that is something that I would pro uh, actively promote personally. And of course, as I say, always get, if you get a chance to talk about intersex identities, mm. do it as much as you can. Include um, intersex conversations, spotlight intersex people if you can. Um, like these are uh, fundamentals, but I think they go a long way in mm. um, actually helping anyone intersex in this uh, world where there is a lot of stigma still surrounding their identity. What do you think, Alex? Oh, yeah, and no, I can I completely agree with you. The only other things I might add is around, you know, this understanding of intersex people and and their bodies, and that it's important. So you know, there's this idea of pathologizing intersex people that there's there's something about their you know that needs to be fixed. It's categorically not true. Um, you know, there's it's there's no need for medical interventions. I mean, there's been no studies that I've seen, no peer reviewed studies that have demonstrated that those medical interventions are actually helpful. But a myriad, you know, a number of a large number of them that have demonstrated that they're harmful. So, you know, I think having these conversations, these hard conversations around, um, you know, bodies and 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 things, what that means at work, and particularly from a healthcare and access to healthcare point of view, um, you know, we're all part of <laughs> or connected with big, large financial services organisations. Is there an an, in, an enshrined, um, you know, series of protections to ensure that intersex um, support is available if if need be, or, or or something like that. It's the same with with trans and non-binary healthcare as well. If there, is there explicit, um, you know, support available to you that's that's backed up with money, with backed up with budget that is legitimized by an organisation, or you know, so I think that that we should reflect as an industry as well on what can organisations do to to spotlight, um, you know you know, the really underrepresented aspects of the LGBT plus community, not just the white gay men, um, <laughs> like, right? I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're everywhere in the industry already. So our voices are very visible, uh, you know, and we're, we're uh, and, and heard, but you know, my, my, our mission at LGBT Great is to ensure that, you know, other voices are heard too, or at least if they are not able to speak themselves, that, that we as allies at least look at some of the issues candidly, openly, transparently, um, with a view to driving positive change. Um, so yeah, so that's a few of my thoughts. I think, yeah. you know, show up, get informed, get involved, and bring the conversation to, to others around you. Um, and when in doubt, ask. I mean, I think that's <laughs> probably my final thing. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I'll just leave by saying that if, um, if anyone wants to reach out um, and discuss this in further, you know, further, we would love to. Um, and um, yeah, keep in touch um, on this issue. We LGBT great will certainly be uh, looking at this in, in lots more detail next year. We've got plans for some intersex surveys, panelists, discussions, all those sorts of amazing things. So um, keep, keep in the loop and um, Drew, drop us a line if you want to have any uh, uh, conversation around this and otherwise I would like to wish you all a wonderful week and thank you so much for joining.